Okay, so I'm going to use these three slideshows here, uh, the 9-11 hijackers, uh, the Hamburg style in the last two years. So I'll probably be going back and forth. Um, I could uh, unite all of these uh, slideshows, but I'm not going to do that because I'll probably go back and forth. Anyway, uh, I'm going to start here first with this one here, the 9-11 hijackers and the road to radicalization. And so uh, here you see uh, some of the uh, martyrdom uh, video shots that were made after the 9-11 attacks by the 9-11 hijackers. If you are unfamiliar with al-Suri, uh, he is the guy who writes the Global Islamic Resistance. And he writes this in the early 90s, and he finishes it after 9-11. And he's the guy who lays down, uh, I guess, the foundation for fighting the jihad, according to al-Qaeda. And notice here... How he talks about an oath between you and God and forming your unit and preparing yourself and you have a personal duty. Uh, this guy is definitely an advocate for having small cells and using that as a method to achieve their goal. Um, so we uh, know that in the last couple of classes we've been looking at the 9-11 hijackers and I've been trying to get you to establish a bio on the main hijackers, the Hamburg cell. And, you know, anything odd, their view on women and so on. So I'll probably try to address these items as they come up. Uh, keep in mind, uh, Ramzi Youssef, this is the guy who was the nephew of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. And uh, this was the guy who was the bomb maker for the 93 Trade Center bombing. He was known to be making chocolate, which was code for making bombs. And the 93 Trade Center bombing motive. Uh, here they uh, outlined their demands to stop military, economic, political aid to Israel, uh, diplomatic relations with Israel, and to basically not interfere with Middle Eastern countries. So if you've looked at Bin Laden's 98 Fatwa, you can see similarities in some of these particular demands. So you start to see from 93 the shaping of Al-Qaeda's ideology. Looking at the uh, Ramsey uh, Yusef uh, timeline. Uh, this guy had some other ideas. He wanted to assassinate the Pope, crash planes into the CIA headquarters, and he wanted to blow up 10 planes that were going to be, uh, you know, ex uh, detonated at a the same time as a show of force. This is from his uh, bombing uh, of an airline uh, that uh, this watch bomb was placed in a Malaysian airline, and uh, this guy's second leg. Uh, was exploded uh, the, the plane but was not enough to bring down the plane so as you know in class we were looking at the bio sheet of Ada, Shihi and uh, Zai Jara and these are the three people who make up the Hamburg cell let's keep in mind that Ramzi Al-Shib this guy was replaced by Hani Hajur he was also a member of the Hamburg cell however this guy could not get entrance into the United States as a result of uh, his uh, passport and, uh, you know, this guy has to be replaced by Hani Hajur and his acquaintances. The mainly concern here with Mohammed Zamar, who was uh, under investigation by the German authorities. This guy had participated in the Soviet-Afghan war. These individuals all meet each other at the Al-Quds Mosque, and uh, they are influenced by this guy, Mohammed Zamar. Uh, the Hamburg cell, that's primarily what we're talking about when we're looking at Shihi, Ada, and Jara, and Ramzi al-Shib. Now, so here we know that these individuals were uh, attending school in Germany, and a lot of their stories come from people who had met them, people they had lived with. Uh, one of the things that's common that you get from the uh, movie The Hamburg Cell uh, was that these individuals were viewed as loners. They were living in Germany, and they're just having a difficult time transitioning. It actually becomes something that helps them later on. The argument, according to the 9-11 Commission report, is that Bin Laden selected them because of they they were familiar with Western ways. Uh, and all of these individuals were, were different. Like uh, Zaid Jara, this guy was known to be somebody who would frequent nightclubs. And people questioned in his family how he could become radicalized. Whereas Muhammad Ada, the leader of the 9-11 attacks, was a little more stern. And al Shihi, this guy was viewed as the religious guy who was definitely well-versed in Islam. Whereas Ramzi al Shib, this guy was more of the peacemaker, usually trying to create peace as a result of some of the things that people disagree with with regard to Muhammad Atta. Here's a screenshot of the Al-Quds Mosque. As again, this was the place where the Hamburg cell meets practices. They learn the Al-Quds Mosque, their interpretation of Islam. 
Um, and so here we have an uh, image of Al-Shib and Muhammad Atta. These were the first two to meet each other. So you got to think Muhammad Atta is in Germany. Uh, this guy is really struggling with fitting in. And uh, he meets Al-Shib. Al-Shib takes him to the Al-Quds Mosque. And before you know it, they are under the influence primarily of this man right here. Let's see. So uh, these three guys live together. Again, he said that uh, Al-Shihi, this is the guy who crashes into the South Tower. Muhammad Atta, the pilot for Flight 11, crashes into the North Tower. And just some items here. Uh, this guy was very uh, religious. Uh, not to say that he wasn't, but this guy was more of a scholar with regard to, uh, you know, Islam. Uh, whereas this guy was rigid, you know, lacking in social skills, where this guy was more of a uh, smooth talker, but definitely a believer in jihad. The three of these individuals rented this particular apartment. And, uh, you know, the argument, according to the 9-11 Commission report, if we're looking at the book Perfect Soldiers, that these individuals uh, live together. They were known to you know, not really watch TV, not listen to any music, but to, to argue. What were they arguing about? They were arguing about Islam and their interpretation of it. Here's a little bio on Muhammad Zamar. And this guy uh, starts to speak at the Al-Quds Mosque, and he's somebody who's arguing about offensive jihad. This is a screenshot, I believe, from the book Perfect Soldiers. And in that particular book, uh, they look at, uh, you know, here you have Muhammad Atta as a, uh, as a child. Here is Muhammad Atta later on. He was going for a degree in architecture. And uh, I believe this one has Al-Shehi, who I just don't know. Can't really make out the image. And that's not helping. All right, so uh, in this particular slide here, what I'm trying to get you to think about is that these individuals all attended this particular meeting. Uh, this meeting was uh, attended by high level Al Qaeda operatives, and uh, it's on the CIA radar. And just think about that. How is it that these individuals are able to uh, attend a meeting? And uh, like, for example, this guy right here, uh, this guy, uh, Ben Atash, he was Bin Laden's uh, bodyguard at some point. These two individuals, uh, Hazmi and Mintar, lived in the United States two years prior to the 9-11 attacks, and they were able to travel freely. And keep in mind, Ramzi al-Shib, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, we mentioned, uh, related to uh, Ramzi Youssef. So all of these individuals in 2000 attend this meeting in Malaysia, that's in the 9-11 Commission Report, yet for some reason they are allowed to uh, these two anyway, travel to the United States freely. And uh, that's one of the things that people think that the CIA, you know, did not give the uh, information to the FBI and that created further issues that will be addressed in a later class. January 2000, again, uh, these two individuals, they travel and they make it back to Los Angeles. Uh, these individuals uh, make it to Arizona, they make it to Las Vegas, and they're able to travel you know, January 2000, freely throughout the United States. Looking at the 9-11 hijackers, here's Hani Hajor. Interesting tale about Hani Hajor. He is a licensed pilot. He attends flight school in the United States in the 90s, and uh, he lived here as well. So one, um, uh, this guy as well lived here. Um, in 2000, he is uh, going to flight school, but all four of these individuals are in the United States prior to 9-11. All of the other hijackers, these so-called muscle hijackers, arrive later on. And uh, here you have Mintar. And where's Hazmi? Uh, Hazmi and Mintar. Why don't I see him? Here he is. Remember, these two guys are in the United States two years prior to 9-11. So the Magnificent 19 is a reference to the martyrdom videos that the 9-11 hijackers make uh, haven't been able to find any video footage of this other than screenshots and these are screenshots from the videos that these uh, hijackers left behind and these would be the muscle hijackers who show up later uh, this is muhammad Atta's will uh, this was made before the 9-11 attacks years before the 9-11 attacks and uh, looking at the uh, will of Muhammad Atta, uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, this guy, uh, like, like, I don't want a pregnant woman or a person who is not clean to come and say goodbye to me because I don't approve of it. You know, if we were uh, in class, Saeed cut up. Uh, this guy would really have uh, no issue with the purification of Islam 
uh, that Muhammad Atta is trying to achieve by this particular item here. The person who will wash my body near my genitals must wear gloves on his hands so he won't touch my genitals. I can't help but think that Muhammad Atta is just a little homophobic. Anyway, uh, let's take a look at the next one, the 9-11 hijackers. And again, just trying to point out some of the, uh, the odd items. And I believe in this one, I have some screenshots of the 9-11 uh, uh, commission report on this one. So 400 to 500,000, that's money to coordinate the 9-11 attacks. Notice uh, most of the 9-11 hijackers, I want to say it's 15 out of the 19 were from Saudi Arabia. And that has always been disputed uh, as whether or not Saudi Arabia was implicated and participated. So again, going back to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, these were some of the initial plans of the 9-11 attacks. Uh, some of the destinations, they wanted to use 10 planes. This is a screenshot here from the 9-11 attacks. He wanted to deliver a speech. You know, uh, the U.S. support for Israel, the Philippines, and repressive governments in the Arab world. So trying to just shape the Al-Qaeda ideology, some of the things that they believed in. Uh, this guy, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, is going to plan it, and uh, you know, uh, Bin Laden is going to pay and provide the soldiers. Um, Al Zahari would be another individual who would provide the soldiers, as we mentioned before, Mintar and Hazmi, and um, you know, uh, you know, uh, Bin Atash here. And just a little bio on these individuals here. Uh, both traveled and fought in Bosnia, these two guys right here, and they're working, you know, odd jobs two years prior to the 9-11 attacks. All right, so Hazmi spent the night in Qatar at a safe house where, according to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Mohammed Estate stayed on his way to Afghanistan for jihad training. So the significant thing here is that they seem to be using a safe house, and the CIA is... Uh, aware of something going on you know why is this individual able to travel but um you know how how come there is nobody watching him you know, these individuals are receiving extensive training yet the 9-11 attacks are able to take place uh there seems to be you know a, a lack of uh involvement with regard to communication between the cia and the fbi so as far as the karachi training that they mentioned these individuals uh attended here uh, he taught the three operatives basic English words and phrases. He also discussed how to case flights in Southeast Asia. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed told him to watch the cabin doors and take off landing uh, to observe whether the captains went to the lavatory during the flight. So this, again, is in the 9-11 Commission report, and this is how they piece together. How do they know this? Well, eventually they start capturing some of these individuals, and these individuals start to... Uh, say things and those things that are said uh, become part of the 9-11 commission report. Khalid returns to Bangkok the following day. Security officials search his carry-on bag and even open up toiletry kit but just glance at the contents and let him pass. So this is all going to act as uh, how you prepare these 9-11 attacks. You know, what are they looking at? The toiletries raise the flag but we were still able to board these flights. The next group here we're talking about, again, is the Hamburg cell. The Hamburg cell, the people hanging out in Germany, primarily getting an education. And these individuals uh, are going to be the pilots. Let's see here. English familiarity with the life in the West. So again, that's going back to that point there. The Hamburg cell. So eventually, these guys have to wind up in an Al-Qaeda camp. Bin Laden is going to know that they are familiar with the English language as well as Western tradition. And these are things that are going to be viewed by Bin Laden as something that he could use to create a successful attack on the United States. Bin al-Shib was decrying what he perceived to be a Jewish world conspiracy. Again, we're talking about the Al-Qaeda ideology. Um, and Jara, as we said before, uh, Jara was somebody who was not religious. And, uh, you know, when they mention his wife here, um, Ansel, that's what, what this is a reference to. He began speaking increasingly about religion and he uh, starts to visit her less frequently. He starts to criticize her for not being religious enough and for dressing too provocatively. So again, uh, you start to see some of uh, Jara's radicalization starting to emerge, and that's possibly a result of his influence uh, you know, that occurred at the Al-Quds Mosque. 
And again, going back here to Zamar, his message is definitely resonating with these three individuals. So that's a little bit on 9-11 hijackers, uh, part one. I'll put up a part two uh, for next class.